My name is Mike Aben and welcome to my KSP campaign. Uh, what you see here is me in the vehicle assembly building trying to assemble a MOHO mission. I have a, a window to MOHO coming up in a little over 20 days and I most certainly want to take advantage of it and I want to shoot for an orbiter. Um, and uh, MOHO? Well, MOHO is definitely perhaps the trickier. I would say I think it is. I think it's the hardest one. Uh, ELO, not aside, you know, but I think MOHO is the bane of a lot of our existences <laughs> trying to plan missions to MOHO. And it's it's the Delta V requirements that's, that it takes to get there. Um, and pretty soon I began to realize that if I wanted to uh, build myself an orbiter, I was going to need more than just these 1.25 meter parts. I broke out the 1.875 meter parts that come with uh, with homegrown rockets. Uh, yeah, the Delta V is quite substantial, and I'm going to take advantage of, you know, I'll, I'll wait till the episode where I actually launch this thing, and then I'll talk about the Delta V requirements in, in quite a bit more detail. But th th they, they aren't insignificant uh, to, to achieve a capture of MOHO. And what's even more frustrating is they can uh, vary quite substantially because MOHO has a rather eccentric orbit for Kerbal Space Program and uh, it's a relatively small target and it means plotting the maneuver it can be you know, it can be a little bit twitchy and uh, it just means it's hard to control the variables and you end up with encounters where the de capture Delta V's especially can vary quite a bit from what uh, formulas and Delta V maps might predict. So it's a challenging, it's a challenging planet to get to and to achieve a capture with, and this is actually reflected in in our real solar system as well. I mean, we there's been probes, many probes have gone to Mars. We hear about probes in Mars. I, I can't even keep track of it. Venus is another one that's gotten a lot of attention, um, perhaps not so much in the press, but definitely by uh, especially the Russians. The Russians have sent lots of probes to Venus over the years, but but Mercury, Mercury has a grand total of two. Two missions that have gone to Mercury. The first was Mariner 10, launched in 1973, and it did uh, actually a, several, a number of flybys, a few flybys, not only hitting Mercury, but also hitting Venus. And the first vessel to actually achieve an orbit, and only the second vessel to go to Mercury, uh, was the Messenger vessel, and that was launched in 2004 and didn't even achieve an orbit until 2011. I mean, that's pretty recent. Right, and that's it. Mercury is a challenging place, uh, and so Moho is is relatively challenging as well. Anyway, I ended up with this vessel uh, with five thousand two hundred eighty four meters per second of delta V. Um, I, you probably are guessing I've yet to unlock the uh, the um, uh, <laughs> the ion engines. That's what I'm shooting for. The electric propulsion engines. Uh, you can get a lot of delta V with a lot less mass uh, out of the ion engines, but I'm still working with boring old chemical rockets. Uh, so in order for me to have delta V, I need lots of fuel, and fuel, of course, means mass. So more specifically, actually, I end up with this uh, probe if you still want to call it that, 19-ton payload is what I ended up with. And to put that into some comparison, the Karayan, which you have seen a lot over the past several episodes, the Karayan fully fueled with the Kegel lander on it uh, is a 22-ton vessel. So uh, this is a pretty big, big boy that I'm, I'm sending on its way to Moho. And you know, to be honest, I'm not that upset about it because it gives me an excuse to break out the 2.5-meter parts that I have been unlocking. Uh, so yeah, the big orange fuel cans, the skipper engines, and all the rest, I get to build myself a nice, nice heavier lifter, which was a fun thing for me to build. Anyway, while I'm putting this together, uh, or finishing off putting this together, why don't we talk about uh, what's coming up in this particular episode. The main mission is going to be uh, another moon mission, a moon landing, an unmanned moon landing except and I did an unmanned moon landing uh, quite a lot a number of episodes ago but there's going to be a couple of things that are going to make it a little different this is going to be a land and return um so we're going to land on the moon we're going to collect some materials bay and stuff like that and then we're going to come back and land back at Kerbin and uh this another part of the mission is I want to Again, take advantage of the seismic sensor as it is modified by the interstellar mod. Uh, you may recall that the interstellar mod modifies the seismic sensor 
so that you can uh, create an impactor and use an impactor to uh, generate some science. But it does take a little bit extra extra planning to get the impactor and uh, to get that all to work. Um, and uh, well, we'll get to that all later. But right now you can see that uh, Moho 1 is getting pretty close to uh, completion here. And in fact, of course, it's going to go through some testing and a little bit of final tweaking. But the actual final product wasn't too different from what you see here. The build time for this thing is about 18 days, which will get it built comfortably before my uh, Moho window is ready. So uh, this thing get I just ended up finishing this thing off, pushing it into the building queue. And we'll get to that uh, moon mission I was talking about uh, shortly. But we'll start off with briefly joining Val and Bob and Bartner as they approach their correction burn on their course out towards Minmus. Uh, you might recall from last episode that we sent these folks on their way to Minmith, Minmus <laughs> with the mission to put our first Kerbal down onto the surface of Minmus. And we're just affecting our trajectory so that we will enter into a polar orbit about Minmus uh, because the plan's also going to be to do uh, low space EVAs over all the various biomes around Minmus. So there we go. Oh, just a little bit more. There, there, th that, that ought to do it. Um, and what we'll do is I'll, I'll tweak this a little bit, but uh, that won't have to be for a while yet. So we're going to be rejoining these folks as they approach the uh, sphere of influence of Minmus, but that won't be for another six days, so that's going to end up being for a future episode. So why don't we head off to uh, join our moon mission, which is now sitting on the pad. Here we have Moon of Three, and as I was talking about earlier, the plan is to land and then return this unmanned probe onto the surface of the moon. Um, and also to take advantage of uh, the modification that the interstellar mod makes to the accelerometer, that seismic center, sensor, uh, which requires the use of an impactor. So I also have to have an impactor be part of this particular probe. So that necessitated a bit of an unusual design. Oh, I'll just mention briefly here, uh, I mentioned last episode that I have a number of mods that aren't quite working 100% with 1.05. And another one that I discovered here is the Waypoint Manager mod. That's the one that's putting that waypoint that you can see above the Kerbal Space Center. Um, and you can see it's there, so the mod is working except for the fact that I can't turn the waypoints off. That part of the mod's not working. So hopefully that will be working uh, fairly soon. So just ignore that little blue circle that you see back there in the background. That's not doing anything. Okay, let's get back to design. So once we lose the lifter, this vessel is composed of three stages. The lower stage is a transfer stage, the job of which is to get us to the moon and to achieve a capture. I'm then going to uh, stage that and jettison it in such a way so that it'll take a long path around the moon and then be our impactor. And uh, I'll show you exactly how I do that a little bit later in the video. We then have a stage that is designed to land on the moon. We're going to do our science on the moon. It's going to take off and then return to Kerbin. And then finally, there is a final stage that jettisons that, 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 that second stage, the top stage just being all the science equipment with the requisite parachutes and probe bodies, so that hopefully we'll land it safely onto Kerbin's surface. Now, the reason I'm doing a land in return is, well, one, just to do it and the extra science that it collects. But what really motivated it was this contract that you see down here, which is to return a vessel to Kerbin after orbiting the moon. I've had this contract for some time. I, I actually misunderstood it to just return some Kerbals. Um, and I've been in orbit around the moon with Kerbals a couple of times, but both times were with the Kurion, and the Kurion doesn't return to Kerbin's surface, so I didn't re meet the requirements uh, to meet this particular contract. So this is, uh, that kind of motivated this particular mission uh, was just this one contract to get a vessel to come back from orbiting your moon and land on it, but I thought I'd make it into a lander and, and do the seismic sensor and add this other stuff just to make things, well, I don't know, a little bit more interesting. 
the issue is, well, it was right around here that I realized that uh, my planning for this particular mission, well, might have be a little bit suspect. If we look at the vessel information being provided by Kerbal Engineer, you can see now that I have 2,532 meters per second left. And I took a look at that and I went, oh, that does not feel right. Uh, and I went through some numbers, like at this point right here, I started thinking about this and I went, okay, let's, let's take a look at some Delta V maps and stuff. Let's transfer to the moon's about 860 meters per second. The capture is about 310 meters per second. Land and ascent again. Uh, I, I give myself about 1400 meters per second or so of that. That would be assuming that I didn't, uh, botch things up too badly. And then the return is about another 310 meters per second. That's a total of 280 meters per second. That's already more than what I have and that's if I did things efficiently and in this mission because of the way in which I'm going to do the uh, the, uh, the, the, the the impactor uh, you'll see in a bit the landing I can't I, at least I can't I can't do the impactor business and that's going to impact on the Delta V as well so I actually need quite a bit less or quite a bit more than the 2880 meters per second so I looked at this going there's just there's just no way I'm going to be able to pull it off. Somewhere I messed up in the planning. Maybe I forgot to count in the fuel to, you know, get off the moon and get back into low moon's orbit. Like I, I didn't count that or I didn't count the transfer out to the moon or something. Somewhere I missed something and I needed to make a decision. One decision would be to just enter the moon's orbit and then just leave again, come back to curb and land and fulfill this contract. That would fulfill the requirements for this contract and get this contract off my plate. But it would collect almost no science. The other option was to just go ahead and do the moon landing. I got enough Delta V to land on the moon, just not to uh, get back home again. And it's not, there's not like there's any Kerbals on board. I can land on the moon and be done with it. And then I can still do the, the whole seismic impact thing, which does collect a fair amount of science. So, contract fulfillment or science? And I went with science. <laughs> That's what I decided to do. I'm gonna, I want to go for the science. So I put this contract away. I said, let's forget about the contract. We'll deal with that. At some other time, I'll have to orbit the moon with something and get it back to Kerbin. That should be easy enough. Uh, let's see if we can do the uh, impact or business and get ourselves some science. So we'll just time warp our way over to the moon get to our encounter, and once we were inside the moon's sphere of influence, it was time for us to uh, think of a landing spot. Now, I've landed on the moon a couple of times, so I definitely want to make sure I land in a different biome to maximize my science return. You can see the one lander there, that's Moon two. That's where it's sitting on the surface, and there's a flag there, that's where the uh, Kegel landed on the moon, so I don't want to land in a biome like that. So I'm eyeing uh, this crater right here. I think this crater here looks good. My trajectory right now is passing a little bit to the south of the crater. But because I'm before periapsis, I'm going to have to do an anti-normal burn or burning towards the south to uh, affect my trajectory and get myself so that my trajectory passes over where I kind of want my landing spot. That's looking pretty good right about there, I think. Yeah, that ought to do it. So we'll cut ourselves over to Periapsis, where we are getting ready to perform our capture. Now you've seen me do lots of captures before, but this time things are a little different because I want to create a trajectory so that when I stage my transfer stage, um, there we go, I got my capture, I definitely want that, but I want a trajectory so that the transfer stage will end up impacting the moon. So what I'm doing is I'm lowering my apoapsis and I'm just really watching my period more than anything else. So uh, I want to get it down lower, but not too low. So seven, six, five, four, four hours. Okay, about four hours now. Let's take a look at this. Yeah. That's a little bit too high, I think. I want it to be, I want to give myself, I want to be able to stage and then give myself enough time to land, but I, I can I can reduce my period a little bit more than that. Why don't we uh, reduce it a little bit more? There we go. What about, let's go for three hours. Three hour period, that should be good. 
That'll give us plenty of time to land and uh, get our seismic sensor ready. Now, the next step of this is to push down our periapsis, and we're going to do that with a radially outburn. Oops, I still had it on the retrograde back. There we go. Radially out. And burning radially out is going to push my periapsis away from me, as you can see, but it is also pushing my periapsis down. I've got to stay on the vector there. And I want to push my periapsis down into the moon's surface. This is the inefficient part of this whole mission that I was talking about. There we go. All right, so that's an impact. So now what I need to do is get rid of that transfer stage. But before I do that, there is a lot of fuel in it. And I want that fuel. I need that fuel. So let's transfer out all of that fuel. And oxidizer, of course, as well. And then we'll stage. Ah, there's still a bit of oxidizer left. I got to get that. I got to do this quickly, too, because, uh, come on. There we go. Out. All right, stage. There we go. We got to do this quickly because I am on my way up. And the further I am away from the surface of uh, the surface of the moon, the less efficient this is becoming. And I need to get my apoapsis down and start getting ready for my landing. So let's let's burn retrograde. No, I, I, oh my god, I don't know what I was thinking about here. No, it's just retrograde. That's what I need to do. I think I've been, I was confusing myself at the time. It doesn't matter that my periapsis is uh, still inside the moon. I'm not, I'm going to be landing before I come around back to there. And again, I'm aiming for this crater. So, just going to keep burning retrograde until I have myself a trajectory that's going to work for me. Okay, keep going, keep going. I'm not going for an orbit here. I'm going for a descent. And like I said, this is why I needed to budget even more than I normally would for uh, landing on the moon because of the inefficiency of all of this. But that is starting to look pretty good. Oh, we got a couple of messages here. Okay, that's just uh, stage recovery with the ascent stage. And, oh, world first milestones. We have entered into suborbital flight above the moon. Well, not the first time, obviously, but the first time since 1.05 was installed, I suppose. I do like these milestone things. Yeah, that's cool. All right, we'll take that. And uh, let's just cut to uh, the later part of our descent. And this will be my third landing on the moon, so you've seen this before. Though this time my descent angle is quite a bit steeper, and... Ugh, yeah, that, that terrain up ahead is looking uh, rather hilly. I think I'll start killing my speed now. Yeah, like I was saying, um, my descent angle is steeper, so I, 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 it won't be as hard to kill off my horizontal velocity, but I do want to keep an eye on my vertical velocity. I am coming down rather quickly already. Uh, I guess another thing compared to my last landing is at least this time I can see the ground up ahead of me, so uh, that makes things a little bit more comfortable. And my last landing, of course, being in the dark where I slammed the lander into the ground and broke uh, two of the landing gear. I want to put it down before I get to that crater. There's a flat area that's getting pretty much below me off a little bit more of that vertical velocity. I'm keeping an eye, of course, on my suicide distance. If that starts getting suicide distance burn, if that starts getting uh, even remotely close, <laughs> I, I start. I don't want to get less than a kilometer until I'm close to the surface. So that's why I put it on the retrograde vector. That's pretty good. Okay, let's uh, let's kill off some more of that horizontal velocity. So we'll aim below. The retrograde vector. And I'm watching that horizontal velocity go down. Okay, it is just a few meters per second now. Let's see if we do a little. Oh, oh, wait, it's going back up again. Okay, let's point up. 
And now it's just watching the speed on the nav ball, the surface speed. Watch my altitude a little bit. I can see terrain texture, so I'm getting close. And uh, make sure that retrograde icon stays on top of the nav ball. Also nice once you can see your shadow. Oh, yeah. I can just see my shadow. I'm not sure you can see it. But I can see it. The sun is mostly overhead. Right. Let ourselves fall. Start arresting velocity. We're getting close. Started to go up there for a little bit. And there we are. All right. We are down, and it's science time. Okay, so we'll start with this atmospheric pressure scan, even though we're in a vacuum. <laughs> but it, whatever. Okay, and we can't keep it, so we're going to have to transmit it in. Oh. I have no communication devices on this vessel. Well, I do, of course, I have this, but it won't, I was hoping it would automatically extend. I don't have any control over it because of a glitch with the Remote Tech XF that I have installed. Okay. Well, I can't bring the data back. I have to transmit it, so uh, you're gonna have to excuse me for a moment. <laughs> Okay, we're back. Okay, let's see how this works. So, materials bay, observe materials bay, transmit. Oh, that's a good sign. And we are transmitting our data. Keep an eye on electricity too. All right, explanation time. Um, the issue I've been having with the antennas come from actually not the Remote Tech mod, but Remote Tech XF, an add-on that I've been using that... Uh, allows you to manipulate the antennas even if you do not have a connection, which somehow, since Remote Tech went to 1.05 and Remote Tech XF didn't, uh, somehow that means you can't manipulate the antennas at all. So Remote Tech XF is now gone. I'm now just on regular vanilla Remote Tech, which is working luckily, as you can see. The other issue is actually with the Science Alert mod, which also is having an issue with Remote Tech once, uh, once Remote Tech went to 1.05 and Science Alert did not. Uh, so, science alert, now gone, so you can see me going around right-clicking on the various science instruments instead of having that panel off there on the right. And I'm just saving the data right now because my uh, electric charge is pretty low, so we'll give the chance for the batteries to charge up again before we start transmitting. But now it's time to uh, start recording some seismic data. So I did this once on the surface of Kerbin, you've seen it before we sit. We click record seismic data rather than log seismic data and it says surface will be monitored for impact events. So now we need to create our impact event. Oh, by the way, here you can see how I'm communicating with Kerbin despite the fact that I'm on the far side of the moon and using only a communitron. It's all because of my communication network I've set up around the moon. It's allowing me to do that. Okay, so here we are. We are at our impactor and... Uh, we're still two and a half, I'm over two and a half hours from our impacts. Let's make sure nothing critical is going to happen. Okay, we do have the uh, launch pad being reconditioned in that amount of time. What's in the vehicle assembly building? Okay, nothing's going to be built in that amount of time. So, uh, yeah, let's just uh, time warp to our impact. And just to explain a little bit further what I had to do, I had to get into uh, editing the save file for this particular game as well because you might recall that that Communitron was stuck in the down position, so I had to edit the save file to uh, to have it extended. I also actually had to reset the materials bay. That's why you might have noticed that the animation had it open, but I was able to record materials bay stuff anyway. And, oh, and I don't know if I mentioned this last uh, time I did this on Kerbin, is you do have to follow your impactor right down to the surface. If you just let Kerbal Space Program uh, remove the debris uh, that won't record an impact. You actually have to get the impact. But we are closing in on that now. 
Three, two, one. Oh, okay. Impact recorded. I can't really see what's going on, but whatever is still left is spinning crazily. And oh, there it goes. All right, it's gone, but I did record an impact. So let's get ourselves to Muna 3 and see what we got. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what it is. I'm always concerned I'm going to mess it up here. There's another stop recording. No, no, no. Collect data. Yeah, collect data. Collect data. 150 science. All right. So uh, let's just keep that because I don't know what my electricity state is. Yeah, my electricity reserves are pretty low. They're the same as what they were when I left it because uh, Kerbal Space Program doesn't monitor it. But that's just a quick a time warp. Yeah, that'll fix that. Yeah, uh, when you are not with a vessel, electricity reserves don't change when it's not the actual active vessel. There we are. We are now fully charged. So find the seismic sensor, right click, review data, transmit. And let's watch it. And then, oh, that's going down fast. It's a lot of data to transmit. Oh, I'm already more than half of my electricity gone. This is not a good thing. Ah. Okay. Well, let's time warp a bit. It is transmitting it in little blurps, so we'll keep time warping until uh, it's all transmitted. Shoot. I should have had more batteries on this thing. Yeah, 67, 68%. This is going pretty slow, so uh, why don't we just cut to the end of the transmission? 99. And done. But I don't recall seeing any information as far as how much data was transmitted. That worries me. And a quick check back at the uh, Research and Development Center confirmed my worries that, yeah, absolutely none of that got transmitted, which is really frustrating because you can see here that I'm at 157 science with what I did transmit, and 160 science would be allowing me to unlock the next node but despite all these things going wrong i'm not done yet i still have some ideas for how i can get some more work out of moon of three but uh, i can see now that i am well over the 27 minute mark with this video it's getting kind of long so i think that's going to have to wait until the beginning of the next episode uh so i'm going to have to thank you for watching and hope to see you next time